Okay, so before, before coffee, I talked about sequencing the genome. So we have lots of Leishmania genomes. You know how to sequence even more of them. You know how to uh, compare the genomes. But that tells you all of the genes that are in, uh, that the, the parasite is capable of expressing, but we don't know which of those genes are being expressed at any given time and under certain conditions, which is really more important because maybe they don't express a particular gene and if you studied that, it'd have no relevance. So to look at what's being expressed at any given time, the best tool available at the moment is RNA-seq. So I'm gonna walk you through the technique from a theoretical perspective, give you some idea of what's involved because it's not for the faint of heart and it's, if you don't know Linux, you won't be able to do it. I can tell you right now. Um, I'll then, at the, at the end, show you some results of what you can learn from RNA-seq um, and proteomics and putting the two together. So hopefully you'll find it somewhat interesting. And then after the break, we actually, I'm actually going to give you some results from our, um, some of the RNA-seq that we've done and ask you some questions about how to analyze it. All right. So, let's get started. Why do we want to do RNA sequencing? Well, basically we want to measure the steady state of RNA under a given condition and we want to compare that to the steady state in another condition. The thought is that that's a reflection of what proteins are being made. We'll see later on in the lecture that's not entirely accurate. But the reason why we do that is because it's pretty easy. You can make cDNA libraries from um, uh, from your parasites very easily. You can get tens of millions of reads from um, a sample for a very low cost. And so you get a very good idea of how much a particular gene is being expressed under a given condition. Importantly, it doesn't even really require an existing knowledge of the genome. And as Jesus showed you this morning, sometimes it's a lot easier to actually get the transcripts uh, than it is to sequence the genome. For our purposes, that's not really relevant, and most of what I'll show you will assume that we have a reference genome, because it's actually easier if you have a reference genome. In addition to that, it gives you more information. You can tell exactly where the transcription start site is if you do the right library. You can look at alternative splicing, and you look at small RNAs, which really are, are different from just looking at the mRNA. So there's a lot of information there, and it's quantitative because it's digital and it has a large dynamic range. What types of different RNA-seq libraries can you make? Well, this is sort of five examples that I've split them up into. Oops. So we can make RNAs from small RNAs or fragmented RNAs, and these are relatively easy to make. You just add linkers on the five prime and the three prime end, and you make, use the linkers to make cDNAs. The problem with that approach is it's got biases involved with it because the ligation step is more or less efficient depending on the sequence. But nevertheless, it's a pretty good approach. You can use random cDNA priming. Um, now, the problem with that is if you don't get rid of the ribosomal RNA, that's mostly what you'll get back. There are some techniques that you can use called not so random primings that will reduce that. In my experience, that doesn't work very well. So generally, we do a poly A step before we start. You can enrich for the three prime in by using oligo DT, DT priming of your first strand so that you can use that to map the three prime end and you'll sample the abundance of the three prime end of the RNA, which is probably a pretty good thing, but you'll lose information about the five prime end. You can do five primed enrichment uh, and in uh, trypanosomatids, including Leishmania, we have the big advantage that all messenger RNAs have the same sequence at their five prime end, and that sequence is not found in any other organism. So splice leader RNA sequencing, where you, where you prime the second strand synthesis with the splice leader sequence, enables you to specifically amplify parasite RNA, even if there's a lot of, um, of host RNA there. And then the last type of library that I'll tell you about is this ribosome profiling, which is a, a special type of RNA-seq library that basically tells you not only what the, the transcript abundance is, but it tells you which ones are being translated at any, any time. And you'll see that that's important uh, for a number of reasons. Um, 
it, it can uh, give you a lot of information that you otherwise wouldn't have. Now, what happens if you don't have very much RNA? Normally, if you're growing up, let's say, promastigotes, it's pretty easy to get 100 micrograms of RNA, so no problem, you can make an RNA-seq library really easily. If you're taking a lesion out of a, an animal or a, a, even worse, out of a human, you're going to get 10 nanograms of RNA, and it's going to be degraded. So how do you make libraries from those types of RNA? Well, there's a number of techniques available uh, that you can use. Um, and this, if you want to go to this paper here, that summarizes them. Um, typically, this RNA's H approach is best if you've got RNA, degraded RNA. What the RNA's H does is it uses oligonucleotides to uh, specifically degrade the ribosomal RNA because you have to get rid of the ribosomal RNA. And you'll see in a, one of my slides that having ribosomal RNA is a problem. Um, there are other techniques that are good if you've got low input RNA. These are amplification techniques. And you'll see here what this graph is from this uh, manuscript is showing that you know, there's about an 80% concordance between the results that you'd get using these techniques on low imp input RNA or poor quality RNA and what you'd get if you had good quality RNA. So that's a pretty good uh, uh, bet. So you can, you can rescue samples that aren't all that good. If you can get better RNA, you'll be better off though. Um, so what do you do after you've got your sequence? Because the sequencing, the making the library and the sequencing is the easy part. That you can pay someone to do. Or you can do it yourself, but it's really just molecular biology. It's pretty straightforward. What do you do after you've gotten back your sequence? And it'll probably be 20 or 30 gigabytes of sequence per sample. So pretty soon you'll have a terabyte of sequence on your computer. Uh, and you'll, I'll show you what the files look like in a moment. But you have to actually know what to do with it. Uh, so. A typical pipeline sort of looks like this. We do a quality check of the sample to make sure it's worthwhile analyzing. Then we map it to our genome. Then we count the number of reads per transcript. Then we do statistical analyses. And then we're probably going to end up doing experiment-specific analyses that uh, are different f for different purposes. And you can string all of these together uh, with scripts if you want, if you know how to program in Perl or or Python. Um, as I said, all of these, pretty much, you're going to have to do it in Linux, because all of the available software is written for Linux users. You can do it at the command line if you know what you're doing. It's better to string them together, but then you really now have to know what you're doing. The best of all for us biologists is to get someone else to do this and put it into a spreadsheet. And that's what you're going to have this afternoon, is a spreadsheet. But you also want to go back and look at the underlying data. And I'll show you how to do that this afternoon as well. And so here's sort of a, a typical pipeline. I'm going to go through each of these steps in st a little bit of detail, but not too much detail, just to give you sort of a, an idea of what you might want to do. You can go to this Wikipedia site if you want to get some more details as well. So what do we do in the quality check? Well, we're basically making sure that the data it's actually going to be worthwhile following up. It's not just a bunch of garbage, which occasionally happens. So typically, we'll make sure that the read quality is good. We'll look at the thousand most frequent sequences to make sure that they're not the same sequence. If you have all of your sequences being identical, then that's probably not worthwhile analyzing. And you're going to filter out the bad reads. You can get an idea of what this looks like by looking at sort of this type of of plot. This is what a good RNA-seq library, this happens to be a splice leader RNA-seq library from Leishmania. This is what it should look like. If it doesn't look like this, then you're going to have a problem. Giving you a little bit of an idea what a short read would look like in this, so you can get this format. Typically, you won't actually get this format. You have to have, have software to generate this. This is a 36 nucleotides. This is a very short read. This is a bit old-fashioned. But, you know, you can see that it's each a base is represented by a different color. So, you know, this looks like you've got reasonable sequence, but you don't know how good that is. So each short read can really be thought of as just a discrete ordered set of nucleotides, um, and each base gets a quality score, which is an estimate of the likelihood that that base was called correctly. So this is what will be spat out of the sequencer. You'll get a fast Q file, 
and it will look like this, except it will be 50 million lines long. So it'll be a text file, but most of you probably won't even be able to open it up because it's 50 million lines long. But the information is all there. You'll see that basically each read has a location, a physical, I, um, a unique ID. Um, it's a little bit hard to read and understand. It really doesn't have much meaning. This is a, a continual fight between bioinformatics people and biologists. Bioinformatics people like unique IDs that have no meaning. Biologists like IDs that give them meaning but then are usually not unique and it's a continual fight. <laughs> I tend to come in somewhere in the middle. Uh, then you've got your sequence and this is, these are short reads, these are only I think 36 nucleotides. And then there's a code here for the quality score and the quality will be anywhere between 1, which is crappy, to 40, which is really good. So you want to be as close to 40 as you can. Uh, you'll notice that this is encoded so Probably I means 40, but I actually don't know. But you have software that can interpret that. So, obviously you can't do what you are probably used to with a, a Sanger sequence where you get your file back and you can look at the sequence and make assumptions about it. That's not possible when you've got 20 million reads, which is actually a pretty small RNA-seq library. Um, so you can't really do that. You add, one way that you can look at them is look at them in aggregate. So this is a, a, a um, graphical representation of a single FASTQ file from a, uh, a run. So this is what one sample would look like. So up here we've got the average base, average uh, quality score at each base position of the read. And you can see that at the beginning of the read it's you know, 32, that's pretty good. And it stays good all the way through, it drops off towards the end. Nowadays, you know, we're going to go out to 100 or something like that, or even 150. Um, it'll, it'll drop off a little bit more. Now, you don't actually, for Leishmania, for RNA-seq, you don't need anything longer than 35 nucleotides. 35 nucleotides for a genome the size of Leishmania will give you a unique sequence. So anything after that is pretty much a waste in terms of counting, but you'll do it anyway because that's sort of standard now. It's a 75 is pretty much a standard run maybe even 150. Uh, you can do paired ends if you want. Again, for our purposes, it's probably not any great advanta advantage to that for just gene counting, but sometimes it's good. Um, this is giving us the, the average or the number of bases at each base position. So each of these is the average of all of the you know, 10 million, 20 million reads. What you'll want to see is that on average, this looks like the base composition of your organism. So you can see that this has a lot of T's and a lot of A's. So what organism do you think this is? Plasmodium. Yep, this is plasmodium. If this were Leishmania, the G's and the C's would be much higher. It would be 60% GC. So, so this is a plasmodium sequence. It's actually a little bit GC rich um, because you're looking at the, the gene coding region which is more GC rich than the typical plasmodium gene. But this, this sort of indicates that you're in the right genome. So, so if you got back this result for a Leishmania, you'd pretty much be suspicious and say someone mixed the sample up. So I always look at these, takes you five minutes, it tells you something. Okay, here's a case that doesn't look so good. So this is a longer read, you can see this is a 75 nucleotide. Now, this again is pleasant. Uh, this actually probably is more like human because you can see the base composition is pretty similar. Um, you see that their base quality is good up until cycle 41 and then something bad happened uh, and the, the quality at that base went down and never really recovered. Uh, so what we can say, and you can see here that something happened and then something really funny happened here as well. So, these are, you've got a lot of ends at those positions. So something happened at cycle 41 here, so it might not be worthwhile analyzing this set of data. Now actually we did analyze this and I'll show you what happened later on. Um, here's a case where we did the QC plot and the quality looked really good. I mean we've got really, these are up around 40, it looks great. But when you look at the base composition, it's not random is it? In fact, you can actually read the sequence from <laughs> this plot. And it turns out that out of the, um, the 15 million reads, uh, 17 million reads in this library, 
13 and a half million of them were exactly the same and they represented a single sequence which happened to be the small, a small subunit of RNA, ribosomal RNA. So we sequenced ribosomal RNA 13 and a half million times because we didn't purify the RNA well enough. Uh, we were trying not so random sequencing when that's why I said it didn't really work all that well. Uh, but we did have four million reads that weren't like this, so we actually could rescue a little bit out of this if we wanted to. I'm not sort of certain that it's worthwhile. But this would tell you that you probably shouldn't actually continue to process this sample. Um, as I said, we did remove them because we were working out the technique at that stage. Okay, so now, now you, you're confident that your read quality is pretty good. Uh, so it's worthwhile proceeding. Now you have to map them to the genome. If you have a reference genome, which you guys mostly will, there's lots of different programs that you can use. Uh, they all are slightly different, um, but essentially they're the same thing. They use quick algorithms to find out where your sequence maps onto the genome. Uh, and they do it slightly differently uh, and they behave more or less the same. You'll notice that some of them can deal with splicing and others can't. For Leishmania that doesn't really matter because we only have two splice genes so we don't care. So any of them. I actually happen to like Bowtie too. Um, it's probably not the best but they're really not that much difference between them. So um, you, you run your aligner It'll probably take you a day or two on the Linux machine with, you know, a few uh, tens of gigs of memory. Uh, and you come back and you'll get a, uh, a SAM file and you use this program called SAM tools to turn it into a BAM file. And as you'll see this afternoon, each of those BAM files is about a gigabyte, big gigabyte in size. A little bit more than that, depending on how many reads you have. So, so uh, you won't be able to read these files as text files. They won't make any sense. Um, but that's what you use. This is sort of the standard file format for aligned sequences. Okay, so what do you have to worry about when you're doing the alignment? So different alignment tools, as I said, have a lot of parameters. Some have more parameters that you can tweak than others. And when tweaking them will affect your results. Are you going to have splicing? If so, well, then you have to use a program that has splicing awareness or you won't get alignments. Um, and then you can tweak what the splicing is. How many bases do you trim? And what, how do you decide whether to trim them? Now, I've already said that you should probably trim them to start with, but the aligners have trimmers in there as well. So you might want to play with that. I generally don't worry about all, all that much. Use the default. But you can, you can fiddle with that. This is probably the most important thing. These two are the most important. What's your mismatch threshold? How many mismatches are you going to allow between the sequence that's in each read and the genome? Well, there isn't a good answer and it depends on the quality score. And the reason why there isn't a single answer is, well, okay, how often do you think the machine's gonna make a mistake? The quality score will tell you that. So you're gonna weight high quality sequences more than low quality sequences. Uh, nowadays, with Illumina sequencing, generally they're pretty accurate. Illumina is a pretty accurate um, um, platform, so you don't have to worry about that too much. But what you do have to worry about is differences from between your sample and the sequence in your sample and the reference genome. So you're going to have some differences. So if you say, I want to only have 75 nucleotides that have to be perfectly identical, you'll probably lose a lot of reads. But on the other hand, you say, oh, well, okay, I only, want, I only need you know, 25 matches out of 75. You're going to align everything everywhere. And you're going to align human DNA, uh, RNA, if there's any in there, it'll align to Lashmania. So you have to fiddle around with it a little bit. Uh, you'll have to work with, for your organism what works. There. You'll have to change this until you figure out what gives you the best results and then stick with it because you don't want to change it after that. The other thing that you might want to change is the reporting mode. So that's basically telling you which reads, how to report the reads that match and where to put them on the genome. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And as I said, the optimal alignment is an iterative process. You, when you're first working it out, you have to align them. You go and interpret, does this make sense? Have I got a lot of 
have I not aligned most of my reads? Have I aligned too many of them? Are they in the right place? What do you do about repeats? Once you've interpreted them and you find something that looks like it's giving you the best result, which, you know, I can't give you too much advice on that, then you repeat it and continually improve it. And then you basically decide, this is what I'm going to use from now on. So, probably the most important consideration is the target, that is the reference genome. If your reference genome is not very good, you're not going to be able to align against it very well. If your reference genome is from a different species, you're going to have a problem. It's not, it's not going to be impossible. I mean, it's perfectly easy to align L. Donovani reads to the L. infantum genome, but there will be some regions of the genome that won't be represented accurately. So you need to, you need to fiddle with that. We also have the problem that we're going to almost certainly be aligning a, um, haploid, a diploid genome against a haploid reference. And so that's going to cause you a problem potentially as well. Generally ignore all of that though. So, how do you optimize? Well, you've really got sort of these three parameters that you can, uh, you can um, change uh, and you'll have to change them according to what works best for you. If you're doing something in Leishmania, you know, you can write to me or someone else who's done it in Leishmania and we can suggest where you start, but um, you really have to do it yourself. Now, the reporting part is that every time you align a read, each of the aligners pretty much does the same thing, is that it decides wh which of these four bins does this read belong into. Is it a no hit? That means that the read doesn't match anything in the target genome. Well, that tells you one of two things. That read was either a bad read or your genome is missing, your, your reference genome is missing that sequence. So if you get a lot of, whoops, sorry. Did I, uh, I go, went back, did I? If you get a lot of no hits, that's telling you that there's something wrong and you should do into that. Typically, you can expect to get 65% or more of your reads aligning. If, if you get that, then you probably should be happy. It would be better to get 90%, but sometimes the libraries are not so good. But if you're getting 40% or 30%, you have a problem. The next thing is that your read matches exactly at one location and only one location in the genome. Well, obviously, this is the best result. You want all of your reads to, to be there, but they're not all going to be there. There's going to be some reads where it'll match twice or 100 times per genome. If all of your reads fall in this bin, then you've probably got your, uh, your um, aligning parameters too loose. So you want to have something that makes sense. For Leishmania, probably about 90% of your reads should be unique because it's not a very repetitive genome. If you're in another organism, it could easily be higher. Uh, sometimes you get too many hits. It matches, and you can change this parameter K. You can say, okay, it's hit more than, let's say you, you set K to be 10. I, I, if, if this matches more than 10 times in the genome, I don't want to know about it. I can't analyze it. So you can get rid of these guys. The reason for doing that is that you'll, you'll certainly want to look at these, but there's going to be a lot of important genes that will be here. If you're looking at a gene that's got three copies in the genome that are virtually identical, if you only look in the unique hits, you will be missing all of these reads, and you'll think, oh, this gene's not being expressed. Well, it is. It's just in the wrong, um, it's in this bin here. On the other hand, you don't know for certain which copy these reads came from. And depending on the aligner, that things can move between these two bins. And depending on the parameters, you can move them between bins as well. So you have to figure out what's the best uh, set of parameters to get you the best distribution of these reads in these bins. And as I said, there isn't one best method. You're just going to have to find out what works best for you. And that might even be different between different samples. Although, if you're using the same genome and the same um, species samples, you can probably pick something that works and, and keep using that. All right. We like to do another set of analysis at this stage because you can find some more problems at this stage. And here's an example where what we're doing is on this plot here, we're plotting the percentage of the, of the reads that were not matching the reference 
at each position in the read. And what we find is that, you know, at, the, at positions 1 through 30 odd, you pretty much matched, every read matched uh, the sequence pretty well there. You know, 1% of them didn't match and that's just sequencing error. But then at this cycle here, cycle number 41, you get a, a big increase where only 50, uh, 30 or 40 percent, and here only 40 uh, percent of the reads actually match the reference. So something bad happened here, something weird happened. Now, so we were trying to figure out what that was, and someone had a brilliant idea in the lab and said, okay, what happens if we, we plot, and you, this is where you need a programmer, to say, I'm going to plot the frequency at each base position, I'm going to plot the frequency of, uh, of the instance where the base at position one is exactly the same as at the next position. And so you should think that if you've got random sequence that should occur about 25% of the time because there's four bases. And lo and behold, yeah, it does. About 25% of the time you've got the same base in the next position. But at cycle 41, 80% of the reads had exactly the same, same base at, the next, at that same position. So something happened here. And in fact, what happened was that the sequencer paused overnight and forgot where it was. And so it reread uh, the base at cycle 41. So everything was frame shifted by one base, essentially. Now, I don't actually remember whether we were able to rescue this. I think probably we weren't. It was probably not worthwhile. But it, at least it helps you to sort of find a problem. If you saw this type of result, you'd say, hmm, we have a problem here. Okay, so we've mapped everything, we've aligned it to the genome, we know where all of the reads look, and I'll show you this afternoon, in the exercise this afternoon, you'll be able to see um, sort of visually where each of the reads are aligned on the genome. And they should be relatively even, you'll see that they're not perfectly even because the libraries are never completely randomly made, but that's always, it's often a good idea to go in and look at that alignment using a program called Artemis that will, there are other programs available, but Artemis is a good start to, for trips, uh, just to make sure that things look okay. But what we really care about is not, you know, generally how they align, we need to know how many reads map to each gene, or really actually per transcript. And so what we do is we count the number of reads that are associated with each gene. And there are a bunch of programs that will do that. Uh, you can write your own Perl or Pythons or R scripts to analyze them that. Often, particularly in the, in the high eukaryotic world, your read counts are expressed as reads per kilobase per million uh, uh, reads. So I personally don't like to use this. It's important for a couple of reasons because first of all if you're expressing them per million you basically are normalizing them because the library sizes will never be exactly the same but you're you're averaging them and using a mean is different from using the median as you'll show in a moment I don't like mean uh, I don't like to normalize by means I like to normalize by medians um, but it's useful since different transcripts are different lengths, if you just count the number of reads for each gene, a short, read, short transcript, you know, 200 base pairs, will have obviously fewer reads than a very long one. So you'll get a biased idea. You might think, okay, I've got, uh, you know, 100 reads for this transcript and 50 reads for that transcript, therefore the 100 read ones is expressed twice as much. Well, if the, if the 100 read transcript is five times longer, that's not true. If you reduce it to reads per kilobase, you can compare those two. Now, I personally don't do that because I don't think it's very accurate and it's sort of a lot meaningful. So I don't find this analysis terribly useful. In ribosome profiling, it can be useful. The reason why I don't use this, if what you care about is the ratio between two samples, then if you make this, it doesn't actually matter. All you have to do is correct for the size of the library. And it doesn't matter how long the transcript is because they're the same length in two different things. So you're basically saying, I've got twice as many reads for each, you know, for this transcript in this sample as I have in that sample. And the ratio will be the same, it will be irrespective of the length. Okay, um, where was I going? Oh, so 
Um, you can use many different methods. I, I, we tend to like to use uh, HTSeq, uh, Cufflinks, mm, you can use that. There are, there are a bunch of different ones. And I'll show you in a moment uh, some analysis that people have done of what's better. Um, but I, I tend to use HTSeq. Uh, then you should do some statistical analyses. Uh, and there again, the first thing you want to do is normalize the read counts because if your library sizes are different between samples, you can't just compare the numbers to one another and get any meaning. Um, how you normalize matters. As I said, just doing a, a mean normalization, which is the read counts per million, is not accurate. A median normalization is probably better. These uh, packages here, EdgeR and DEC, you actually use EA quantile uh, normalization, which is probably even more accurate, although not entirely accurate. Normalization is actually a big issue, and none of these normalizations, you have to remember, none of these normalizations will correct for the actual RNA content within the cell. If the RNA content between two samples per cell is different, that won't, you won't know that from your RNA-seq library. So what you're always doing in RNA-seq libraries is you're really comparing to the um, mean or the average, be it median or quantile or, or mean, the average, uh, you're assuming that the average transcript is expressed at the same level in both samples, when it actually probably never is. So at the end of the day, if you say, okay, I've got this particular gene is, is expressed at twice the level in th this sample that is in this, let's say it was pro-mastigotes versus amastigotes. So we have twice as many reads in amastigotes. That doesn't mean that that RNA is twice as abundant in amastigotes. It's probably actually not. What it means is compared to all of the other RNAs, it's upregulated. So it's an important consideration that everyone always forgets about. And there isn't really a good answer to that. Uh, from a molecular level, it, it matters, but from, a, from a, uh, a pragmatic level, it doesn't. You should also remember that if you do a, a northern blot or a QT, Q, uh, um, a PCR, you'll also get the same answer because you're actually loading the same amount of RNA, not, never load by the number of cells. So remember that. It may or may not matter. Okay. Um, we tend to like edge R, but... That's just personal preference. And then finally, you can do experiment-specific analyses. So here's what Artemis will look like, and you'll be playing with this this afternoon. We might, you might want to care about what strand you're on. And so you can make the libraries so that, such that you can tell what strands they're on. If you use a different technique, you might not be able to tell what strand they're on. For trypanosomes or Leishmania, I think it's important to know that you're on the coding strand and not the anti-coding strand. So, I tend to like to know what strand I'm on. In uh, Leishmania, you can actually do um, splice leader site changes, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in more detail. In other organisms, this is sort of the equivalent of uh, splice, alternative splicing. And then, obviously, for ribosome profiling, which I'll talk about at the end, you'll use a completely different set of analyses uh, than you would for other um, experiments. So, a comparison between the commonly used pipelines, and this is the reference that I got this from, it's relatively recent, so stu still should be fairly accurate. Uh, and basically, the, the take home message is that if you're working in a eukaryote, uh, and even though we technically are in a eukaryote, we're not really, because we don't have splicing, the splicing aware aligners are better. So you don't really have to use the splicing aware um, uh, aligner. In this analysis, they thought that HTSeq was the best read counter. So, but it wasn't really all that much better than any of the others. You can see here that you know, some of them are, are clearly better. This one, I think, is bow tie with uh, flex uh, conductor, and you can see it had the worst error rate. So that's probably not a good combination. But all of these are about the same. Um, the coverage, the depth of your library matters. If you increase the depth of your library, let's say you sequence um, 20 million reads versus a million reads, you're going to be better off. When you get to 30x coverage, 
it probably doesn't get any better. So, uh, so um, you know, for, for me, I like to be in the 20 to 50 million range. That's a high enough coverage in Leishmania that we're more than 30x. We're probably more like 100x. Um, once I get fewer than 5 million reads, you're going to not get very many counts for a lot of your genes. When you plot the read count, what you'll find is, and I think we sort of got this, someone had a slide on this yesterday, um, most, there, there are a small number of, of mRNAs that account for most of the reads. So for instance, tubulin, there's probably 50 to 100,000 reads per library. Whereas, you know, some gene in the middle of nowhere that's hypothetical, you might get 10 reads. Well, comparing two, two um, samples that have 50 million reads for each gene, you're going to get really accurate results. If you're comparing the difference between 10 and 5, that's not going to be very accurate. So depending on the depth of your library, you're going to be driving more genes down into that low level. I, I personally am skeptical of, uh, of read counts lower than, certainly lower than 10. If it's lower than 10, I really am skeptical. If it's lower than 100, Mm. If it's, let's, let's put it this way. If I get more than 100, I'm, I'm pretty happy per read. If it's less than 100, it might not be all that accurate. And in fact, there is a problem that I, I don't have a slide on, is what we typically do is we take our read counts that come out of EDGE-R, well, actually going into edge we always add five reads to each read count so that you never have a gene that has zero reads. And the reason for that is you can't divide by zero. So if you have zero reads under one condition and 100,000 reads under the other condition, you, can't, you won't actually get a, a full change value. Uh, if you get zero, if you get one read under one condition and five reads under another condition, you'll get a five-fold change. But the likelihood that that's accurate is very low. So if you add five reads to each of those, you'll be six versus 11. So you'll still be a two-fold, but well, actually be six versus uh, 10. So it's not even a two-fold. So that's probably telling you that I shouldn't really trust this read. So I'm, I'm de-emphasizing it. I, we fiddle around with how many reads to add, and you could sort of add 100, or you can add whatever. Five seems to work pretty well. Um, OK. One more little piece of information from this analysis is that some genes were problematic no matter what pipeline you use. In fact, low abundance, short, low abundance RNAs, that especially those that are short, as I said, none of the programs will give you a very accurate representation of that because you just don't have enough reads. So you can't trust them. You could try to increase the coverage, but they're still probably going to, you know, if you've got a low count number, even if you sequence twice as many reads, you'll go from one read to two, and that's probably not going to help you. So you just have to not worry about it. All right, so that's RNA sequencing analysis in general. I should probably stop here and ask whether there's any questions about anything I've said so far before I go on and tell you how we've used this in Leishmania specifically. Everyone's really comfortable. They know exactly what to do now. And we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> and I'm not even having you do the hard part. I mean, I, I could have, if I wanted to, have provided you with a fast Q file and said, go and align it. And I pretty much guarantee that no one would have finished it by <laughs> the end of the day. So I'm going to give you the, the end result. OK, no questions? All right, so how is this useful in in trypanosomatids and in Leishmania and specifically. So we've used it for transcript mapping. We can um, basically map, um, if we use small RNAs or fragment the RNA, we can sample all of the transcripts. So we can see how much of the genome is actually being transcribed. And the answer in trypanosomes or in Leishmania is everything's transcribed, but usually only on one strand, or at least one strand's transcribed 10 times more than the other. Um, so when you, when you look, and you'll see this afternoon, Basically, the entire genome is transcribed on one strand. Um, and that's because you have polycystronic transcription. But there will be different levels. Even two adjacent genes can vary by a hundredfold in their transcript abundance. We can use splice leader uh, mapping to map the 5'ms of all of the RNAs. And I'll show you an example of that. 
we can map the three prime ends by using oligo to t priming. So this really tells us a lot about where the boundaries of your transcripts are. Because if you go to tritriptyb right now, most of the time what they call a gene is from the ATG of the CDS to the stop codon, right? And that's not the messenger RNA. That doesn't, that misses the five prime UTR and the three prime UTR. And so that's important. I, I'll show you a couple more examples of that in a moment. Obviously, this is probably the most important thing. We want to know what are the changes in transcript abundance. And we can use either fragmented um, uh, mRNA or random priming, or we can use splice lead RNA to do that, uh, those uh, techniques. And I'll show you a couple of examples. If you use splice leader RNA, we get information about differential use of splice sites, which does happen. It's complicated, though. And then ribosome profiling is useful for correcting annotation, which I'll have you do this afternoon. But it also, as I said, measures the transcription rate for each mRNA. So you'll see that that's actually quite common where the RNA level doesn't change, but its translation does. And if you just rely on RNA-seq, you would completely miss it. Okay, so... I just put this in here to remind you, I'm sure everyone knows this, uh, that, that trypanosoma to transcription and RNA processing is unique. Um, is that we have polycystronic transcription that starts in divergent strand switch regions and proceeds to convergent strand switch regions. Although this is not strictly true, about half of the time you start at, a, at an internal site and you go to a termination site. So this is a bit simplified. But, you get multiple genes on the same transcript. And usually it's anywhere between 10 and 100 genes on the same transcript. But those genes, so they're all transcribed at the same rate. And in fact, there's no evidence in, in Leishmania that, that different chromosomes transcribe at different rates. It seems like everything's transcribed at approximately the same rate. In, in African trypanosomes, because um, they use RNA polymerase 1 for VSG genes and procyclic genes, those genes are transcribed at about a hundredfold higher rate than in all of the other protein coding genes. But we don't have that in Lashmania. With one exception, actually. We did find many years ago a, a uh, protein coding gene that had translocated into the ribosomal RNA locus and was upregulated. Um, there's epigenetic control of initiation and, and termination by uh, histone modifications, but that's a detail that we don't need to worry about. This Initial transcript is actually processed by uh, addition of a 5 prime splice leader sequence and a 3 prime poly A tail. It's actually processed while it's being transcribed. So you never see uh, a transcript that's got more than two or three genes on it because that machinery all acts together at the same time. And so you, while everything's transcribed at the same rate, these processes occur at different rates. So adding the splice leader side in the poly A tail can be more or less efficient. And then obviously once you've got your stable, once you've got your, your final uh, messenger RNA, that can be, the, the stability of that, its turnover time, can vary um, tremendously. So, an example of how this is useful. So we've, we've made, in our lab, more than 100 splice leader libraries from several different Leishmania species. We've made poly A libraries from only two species. And the first thing that we've done is map the 5 prime and 3 prime boundaries of most genes. Now, most of this is not in TriTriptyB. We have got the Leishmania major data into TriTriptyB. So Leishmania major is the only genome in TriTriptyB, only Leishmania genome, where you can tell where the 5 prime and 3 prime ends of most of the genes are. And we've done it and, and some other people have also done it. I, I don't know whether the Spanish group's data is actually in there now. Uh, we've done it for all of these other species, we just haven't loaded it up to try TRIPTB yet. Um, so, what do are, what are the data tell us? We got really high coverage for most genes. So when we looked at the splice leader libraries, more than 80% of the genes had at least 100 splice leader reads. So we, have, we can be really confident that we know where the splice leader site is. Um, more than 60% of the genes had 100 or more poly A reads. So we can be reasonably confident where the uh, poly A sites are. What did that tell us? It told us that most genes have only one major splice leader site. So this is a complicated uh, graph here on the uh, y-axis. This is the number of genes. And then on the x-axis, this is telling us 
what percentage of the total number of reads for that gene were at a single site. And so in, in this bin here, between 90 and 100% of all the reads for that gene were at a single site. So this is most of the gene. Most of the genes have a single major splice leader site. But there are a fair number of genes where, look at this here, there's 500, 700 genes where only 40% of the reads are mapping to the major site. And in fact, there are several other sites. So, so you can have three or four or five or even 10 splice leader sites. So while mostly most genes have a single major site, almost no genes have only one splice leader site. And many genes have multiple equally abundant splice leader sites, which will become important later on. When we get to the three primed end, most genes have two or three major poly A sites. So the three prime, the five prime end of most genes is in the, most transcripts is in the same spot. The three prime end almost never is. There's almost always multiple poly A, different poly A sites. They may not differ very much. They may be pretty close to one another, but there's multiple poly A sites. Whether that's important or not is hard to know. So what does a typical gene look like uh, in terms of the 5 prime and 3 prime UTR size, sizes? So most genes, the vast majority of genes, have a very short, less than 500 base pair, um, 5 prime UTR. So, so typically, the first AG upstream of the start codon is where the, poly a, where the splice leader site is, typically. So maybe two-thirds of the gene. But there's a lot of genes where the splice leader site is 100, uh, is 1,000 nucleotides upstream of the ATG. When you get to the, f oh, and then there are 5% of the cases where the splice leader site is actually downstream of the annotated ATG. So as you'll see in a moment, that tells you that the annotation is wrong because that gene cannot be translated from that ATG because that ATG is not in the messenger RNA. So about 5% of the time we were wrong. And, you know, I annotated L major, so I thought I was getting it right. But apparently not. At the 3' prime UTR, they're typically longer. So most of them are pretty short, but you see there's a long tail here. So a lot of them have very long 3' prime UTRs, sometimes, you know, several kilobases. Um, and about 10% of the time, the poly A tail poly A site that we mapped was upstream of the stop codon. So, hmm, what does that mean? Could be an artifact, and in fact, many times those sites were at A runs on the coding strand. So they may, we may have primed at an internal A run because we're using oligo to T. But there is a, there's a, some, a couple of papers coming out of Brazil where this seems to actually happen um, and these really, the end of the RNA really is at this position. So, so what we may be measuring here are just sort of RNAs that have been processed short of the, of the stop codon, and they've had poly A tails added to them. Now, obviously, will not be functional. So if most of your RNA has a, a poly A tail before the stop codon, then it's probably not going to be as functional. So you might be able to use that information, but um, I don't know. It's hard to know. All right, so um, in terms of using this information for <coughs> re-annotation, uh, Gautaman uh, Ramasamy in the lab made this little graphical interface that combined the poly A uh, and RNA-seq libraries together and, and presented them in a nice little interface that enabled us to go through and look at each of the genes in L major and decide where we thought the major splice leader site was and where we thought the poly A tail site was. Uh, and so we went and hand annotated every gene before we submitted it to, to GeneDB. Now, I have to say that even though we've given it to GeneDB, it's actually not in TriTripDB yet. So, so there are errors in TriTripDB, and I will show you some. About 5% of the time, they're wrong. Um, and here's a case in point, all right? So in L infantum, and in L major, 
you'll see that there's a longer trend, there's a longer coding sequence than in El Brasiliensis and in El Mexicana. So, well, is the gene really that much longer in Infantum and Major? Well, it's not very well conserved, so maybe not. But let's see what the data tell us. So we map the splice leader site for L major and for L infantum, and lo and behold, the major splice leader site is not, it's downstream of the, uh, of the ATG. So that's pretty good evidence that this is really not going to be translated. When we looked at, at Brasiliensis and Mexicana, the poly A site was in exactly the same position, but now it's upstream of the ATG. So I think all of this evidence is really pretty compelling that these annotations are wrong and that the real translation start site is that methionine there. And as I said, about 5% of the time, that's the case. And it depends a little bit on who did the annotation. If you annotate by just picking the longest uh, off and calling that the CDS, you're going to be wrong 5 to 10% of the time. When I tried to do L major, I thought I was going to be clever and I used some other things, but I got it wrong 5% of the time as well. So. Uh, and in fact, what I did was sometimes I made it too short by, by uh, making it too short, and we'll see that in, in, in a moment. Probably it's more, more common to have it too long now. And that will make a difference because when you, you'll think the protein has sequences on it that it really doesn't. So if you make a a prime, if you make an antibody against this portion of the protein, it's not going to react to any, anything, and you're going to be frustrated. Okay, the other thing that this will tell you is here's an example. It's actually a similar example. Uh, here's a gene that has an internal A2G, so obviously, uh, internal splice leader site, so obviously we got the 5 prime end of this gene wrong, but that's not what I want to show you this for. The splice leader site's up here, right? And there's a poly A site right there, but there's no gene there. So we've got splice leaders here, and we've got poly A's here, and they're pretty abundant. So obviously, there's a transcript that's fairly abundant that fits right in there. It does not have an open reading frame in it. So it's a 1612 nucleotide non-coding RNA. Whether it has any function, I don't know, but there are hundreds of these. Because, as I said, there's really no gaps in the uh, transcription, the transcript map of Leishmania. Where you've got a big gap between two coding sequences, there'll be an RNA there. Whether it has a function or not, we don't know. <coughs> All right, so now that's basically improving the annotation. And we'll do a little bit of that this afternoon. What else can we learn from RNA-seq? So I'm going to give you four examples. Response to nutritional stress, stage-specific gene expression, and by extension, looking at pro-mastigoat to amastigoat differentiation. And then I'm going to talk about, as part of this, translational regulation. So let's go through these. This, these have been uh, published. This was a, a study we did with Norma Andrews a couple of years ago. Um, Norma grew L. amazonensis for 24 hours in iron-depleted medium. And we did RNA-seq on the total RNA for uh, these parasites that have been grown in depleted medium, iron depleted medium, we compared them to RNA from those that have been grown in iron rich medium. And we looked for differences. And we found 68 genes that were higher, or at least twofold higher, in iron depleted medium. And interestingly enough, they were mostly involved in transport, uh, often iron transport, or in autophagy. And so the autophagy is probably not unusual. The, they cells are starting to die. We also found 66 genes that were downregulated, and most of these looked like those that had function. They looked like they were involved in electron transport, and they probably were enzymes that used iron to function. So the parasite can apparently sense that there's no iron around, and so it upregulates some genes because it wants to kill itself. And it downregulates other genes because they're not going to work properly and they'll just gum things up. So, so there must be a sensor in this that is hooked up to regulation of RNA abundance of just a small number of genes. When you look at purine starvation, and this was a study I did with Nicola Carter uh, a year or two ago, 
growing El Donovani in purine free medium compared to that, gr that grown in purine uh, containing medium. And we did exactly the same experiment. And we found 300 genes that were upregulated by twofold. Now we only did this, uh, we only made one library here, so this is probably a bit too high. There was probably some noise in there. And again, these were involved in transport and autophagy, uh, and also some GP63 genes were upregulated. Uh, and about 200 genes were downregulated. Uh, most of them are hypothetical, but there were some cell division genes in there. And you can Im imagine that this would make sense. If you've got no purines, then you probably are not going to be able to divide uh, your, yourself because you won't be able to replicate your, RNA, uh, your um, uh, DNA. So again, they must have a sensor that's sensing that they're running out of purine. And so it regulates some of the RNAs. What happens when we compare procyclics, metacyclics, and amastigotes, uh, in this case for major? And this is a study I did with Steve Beverly a number of years ago. Never managed to publish it. Um, some stage we might do that. Uh, so what we found was that there were, you know, a thousand genes that changed if you compare um, procyclics and amastigotes. There were about a thousand genes that were higher in promastigotes than in, in amastigotes. Uh, and here's a list of them. There were, you know, a histone gene here and a few sort of things that were not uh, trans nucleotide transporters. A whole pile of things, mostly hypotheticals. Paraflagella rod protein, obviously, because amastigotes don't have very many. Uh, and then a fairly high number that were up in amastigotes. There were also about 200 genes that apparently changed their major splice leader position. Um, now, what was interesting was when we compared promastigotes to metacyclics, they're both, we pro procyclic promastigotes to metacyclic promastigotes, we found even more changes. So, metacyclics, if you look at their RNA, metacyclics are more different from procyclics than they are from amastigotes. If you just look at the level of the RNA, and it's because metacyclics don't divide, and dividing cells change their RNA levels quite a bit compared to non-dividing uh, uh, non cells are quite different from dividing cells. Lots of RNA levels change when you stop dividing. All right, so. In this experiment, we found there was actually no need to even isolate the, the parasites. Steve um, gave us some RNA that had been isolated from lesion foot pads, and they had actually done a very quick and dirty isolation of, of the of the uh, parasites from the lesion, it, you know, very quick. So they weren't, certainly weren't purified. Uh, it took less than five minutes. We got an, a microgram of RNA, so it had a lot of, of uh, mouse RNA in there. Um, and we did splice leader sequence, and out of the 21 million reads that we got, 15 and a half million, almost 16 million, aligned to L major. So we really were able to um, enrich the Leishmania transcripts in a, in a pool of, of mouse RNA. And in fact, we've done that more now, and we can pull out uh, Leishmania RNAs with about 100 times more mouse RNA in there by using splice leader RNA-seq. Now, the advantage of this is that if you spend an hour isolating amastigotes from your lesion, they aren't going to look like what they look like in the, in the foot pad. So, being able to do this really means that you can actually look at what the transcript levels are in the, the host. What was more important is that the RNA levels looked very similar to isolated amastigotes. There were a few differences. There were about 50 genes that showed a fourfold difference. Now, whether this was because these genes were... Uh, were uh, probably, in this case, these genes were probably things that changed during the time it took to isolate the, um, the amastigotes. So it tells you that there are some differences. The good news is that there's not all that many differences. Although this is a fourfold cutoff. There are a lot more that showed twofold. But still, it's pretty, a pretty good correlation, a correlation coefficient of 0.94. So it turns out that it's actually not all that much of a problem, but it is something of a problem. Um, this is an uh, experiment that we did with Greg from Wenwei in his lab. Um, isolated, um, Donovan, uh, isolated RNA from L. Donovani axenic amastigotes and from um, 
infected macrophages. And here he didn't bother to get to isolate them, the amastigotes at all. He just did total RNA. So, so probably something more than half uh, or two thirds of the RNA uh, in the infected macrophages was, was mouse RNA. Actually, it might have been human. I can't remember what uh, cells you used. The good news here is that there were very little difference between these two samples. So there were seven genes that were higher in axenics. Uh, and here's sort of what they are. Uh, and then there were only seven genes that were lower in the uh, axenics, and they were higher in the macrophages. And most of those were transporters and some lipid metabolism. So you can imagine that the, um, the uh, nutrient conditions in culture are going to be different from that inside of a macrophage. So, so it looks like they're, they're changing some of the transporters. The good news is that I think this tells you that axenic amastigotes look pretty much like real, quote, real amastigotes. Um, we did a similar study comparing axenic uh, promastigotes, so procyclic promastigotes that have been cultured. And we compared them to um, uh, cells, uh, parasites from the gut of sandflies. And we did this with splice leader RNA seq, and we found more genes that were different. There were 143 genes that were up uh, in insect-derived parasites and a smaller number of genes that were, were higher in cultured promastigotes. Uh, when we looked into these, these looked like things that were typically upregulated in metacyclic. So that makes sense because, as Hesu showed you yesterday, this probably contained a lot more metacyclics than the cultured parasites do. So, so the sort of take-home lesson of this for me was that, that cultured procyclic promastigotes look less like what's in the fly than axenic amastigotes look like amastigotes within macrophage. Uh, so you have to be careful. And I think it makes a lot of sense from what, by what uh, Jesus said yesterday. All right, so last part here, uh, in vitro differentiation of El Donovani. This is a system that that uh, uh, Dan Zilberstein has been working on for a number of years. You can, you can take pro, promastigotes and you expose them to uh, a pH and a temperature signal by lowering the pH and raising the temperature, thereby sort of mimicking what happens in, um, inside the macrophage. And they differentiate over a process, uh, over a period of five days, they differentiate into axenic amastigotes. And this works well for Donovani and for um, for Amazonensis. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work for, for L major. Um, Dan's uh, identified four distinct phases of, of differentiation. In the first couple of hours, the cells stop dividing and they just sort of sit there. By 10 hours, they've rounded up and they've started to think about dividing again. By 24 hours, they're dividing. They look really morphologically like um, uh, amastigotes, but they haven't fully differentiated until 120 hours. Uh, so um, we did RNA uh, microarray uh, array analysis of this. I mean, we've recently done RNA seq analysis, and Dan had done some proteome, proteomics analysis on it. Um, and so when you look at microarrays, we found uh, a couple of hundred genes that changed. Uh, there were more down than up, and most of the changes occurred in phases one and two. Uh, and this has been published, so I won't belabor the point. Um, when we looked at RNA-seq, we did, first of all, we did splice leader RNA-seq uh, on the same samples, and we found a lot more changes. Uh, and that's because RNA-seq has a much higher dynamic range. So this is, I think, sort of good and bad news. Uh, there are a lot more changes, but they were relatively subtle. So most of them were only two to fourfold, and you can see them sort of here. What puzzled me a little bit is that in this case, there were more genes that went up then went down, whereas in the microarray that was the other way around. Now we've redone this with total RNA and we're back to more down than up. And I think it has to do with the normalization of the libraries. So I think that this up and down thing is really misleading. Um, it's entirely possible that um, we basically can't tell whether they're going up or down. They're just relative to everything else, they're going up or down. Um, what was interesting here was that m there was much more down regulation early on and there was much more up regulation later on. Um, there was a reasonably good correlation 
between the RNA seq and the and the microarray, but it's not great. I mean, a correlation coefficient of 0.5 is not wonderful, so it does cast some doubts on what's going on. Um, I told you about that. It's obvious that the, the RNA-seq is more sensitive. So if you look at this axis here, these are the genes that change by RNA-seq, and these are the genes that we found to be changed by microarray. And you'll see there's a whole pile of genes right here that didn't really change by microarray, but changed by RNA-seq. And I think the reason for this is by these are genes that there's more than one copy in the genome, and we could distinguish them by RNA-seq because they had some sequence differences. But by hybridization, you're hybridizing to multiple probes. So you're getting multiple RNAs hybridizing to the same probe. So, so I, I think it's more sensitive. Um, this, Dan has published this iTrack stuff. The reason why I'm showing you this is that he's able to show that there are a lot more proteins change uh, during differentiation than, than RNAs do. So, so the point of this slide is that the changes in mRNA abundance are not the same as um, protein changes. So he had 902 genes where we had both RNA and protein data, and there was only a really modest correlation between these two. In fact, you know, it was as bad as 0.17. So, in, particularly in amastigotes. So relying on the RNA level, the change in the RNA level was not a particularly good uh, measure of the protein level. And in fact, you can see that here in this. And this has been published. Um, there were out of these 900 genes, uh, about 10% of them, the uh, RNA level went up and the protein level went down, up. And there were some down here um, where the, uh, actually I forgot them, they were, these guys, no, where were they? Here, the, about a third of them, both the RNA and the protein went down. But there were a number here, so 66 genes where the RNA level went up, but the protein level went down. And then, there were 130 where the RNA level went down and the protein level went up. So if you looked at the RNA, you're going to get a completely wrong picture. Um, there are many, there are a number where the RNA went down and the protein level didn't, didn't change. So in, in general, the RNA levels seem to go down, but the protein levels don't really change very much. So that, I don't quite know what that means, but it means essentially that the RNA is not a good... It's not, certainly not a perfect uh, surrogate for protein levels. And this has been found in other organisms like yeast and humans. So, so really you have to be very careful about using RNA-seq data to infer that the protein levels have changed. It may have changed, and in fact a third of the time that it will have changed. But you won't know that until you actually look at it. Um, I'll show you another example where that's not likely to be the case though in the um, oh, so before I get there, I'll, I'll go to ribosome profiling because I think this is where you actually can get information about what the protein level really is likely to be. It's not perfect, but, but it's better. So, so what, how does ribosome profiling work? You basically take your cell and you, um, you isolate the cell, you freeze them very quickly, and you isolate the polysomes. Um, you don't actually have to isolate the polysomes, but that's what we did at the time. You then um, take those polysomes and you divide them into two. Half of them you isolate RNA without doing anything to them. So you're looking at the total messenger RNA levels. The other half you digest with ribonuclease. So you digest all of the free mRNA except for the 28 nucleotides that's protected by a ribosome. So then you make a library. So the, the total RNA without digestion you shear to the same size. And then you make two libraries out of those. And so in one library, you have a representation of the RNA level, the messenger RNA level. That's the fragmented poly A plus library, the measure of the total RNA concentration for each gene. The ribosome profiling, you basically are seeing what's the concentration of messenger RNA, how much of the messenger RNA is being actively translated at any given time. Not only does it give you a measure of how much is being translated, but it will tell you where the translation is occurring. Is it over the entire gene, or is it just at the beginning? Has it started and stalled? It also tells you, as you'll see in a minute, where the translation start site is. Uh, and so you then can also compare the level of the ribosome profiling data, the number of reads in the ribosome profiling, to the messenger RNA, and you get a measure of the translational efficiency. 
So on average, the translational efficiency should be one because we've normalized both libraries. But a lot of genes have a translational efficiency of 100 times more than normal and others have 100 times lower than normal. And so that translational efficiency, a change in the translational efficiency is almost certainly telling you that there's a translational regulation. And you will see that this afternoon when you look at this data. All right, so here's an example of that. This is an Artemis plot and you'll look at this again today. The, the green here is the messenger RNA uh, reads, the fragmented mRNA lead, reads from zero hours during uh, differentiation. And this is exactly what you'll be looking at this day, this is what you'll be looking at this afternoon. Uh, here's what it looks like for the same region of the genome at 24 hours. And you'll see that they look pretty much similar. The red reads are splice leader RNA. Right? So, this gene looks like there's RNA there, there's, uh, it's being translated at about the same level. So nothing really is happening. The RNA levels are about the same. Uh, the fact they're higher here than they are higher here is a library size artifact. Um, so nothing's happening to this, it's not being changed. This guy here, you'll see that there's really very little messenger RNA in either sample. There's maybe a little bit more at 24 hours. At zero hours, there's virtually no ribosome profiling read, so it's not being translated. The translation efficiency is really low. At 24 hours, wow, we get a lot of reads. So the translation efficiency has gone from, you know, 0.2 or something up to 10 or 20. So this, G this mRNA is being translated even though the RNA level hasn't changed. So this is clearly translational regulation. And there, you'll see in a moment, there are hundreds of these. Um, just as a little aside, you'll notice that if we look at the splice leader sites, here, there's no splice leader here, and there's no splice leader here. So, it looks like this region here is just sort of giving us background RNA levels, but here it looks like we've actually put a splice leader site on it, and presumably there's a poly A tail here. Is that, that's correlated with translation of this. So, so could it be that this translational regulation in this instance is purely that we've now put a splice leader site in the right position so that you actually now have uh, a single messenger RNA that can be translated. Don't know, haven't tested it. Alright, so when we look at all of this data we find that about 1500 genes change in their messenger RNA. They go either up or down. Uh, between 0 and 24 hours. So that's sort of the same as what we got from our uh, splice leader RNA-seq data before. But 2,200 genes change their translational level. So 2,200 out of 8,500 genes show a two-fold or more change in their uh, ribosome profiling counts. And in fact, even more of them change their translational efficiency. So sometimes there are genes where the RNA level goes... Uh, down and the translational efficiency goes up a lot but it ends up that their, their change in, in total translation is not really all that much. There's also probably, well we know there is a global decrease in protein synthesis that occurs during uh, axanic uh, or during differentiation as well. So how to interpret the results to, to get this, I don't know. Alright, so I, we're on the home stretch here. Remember I said that the splice change in the splice leader site might play a role in translation? Well, when you look at, at, at developmentally regulated messenger RNAs, they fall into several classes. So you can see some genes, they change their abundance. So here at um, you know, procyclics, they really got a pretty low level. At about 10 hours, there's a lot more RNA. This is the splice leader RNA-seq library. So the splice leader site is at the same position. There's just more of it. And then in this case, they actually come back down again. So really, the, the level of this RNA is changing, but the site of the splicing is not. In this case here, the level of the RNA stays the same, but in this case, in promastigotes, pro half of the RNA has a splice leader site here, and half of it's here. When you go to amastigotes, it's all moved to this site. And in this case, actually both of them occur. So we see all three of those cases. Does that matter? Well, I'll give you a couple of cases where I think it does. So here's a gene encodes uh, protein phosphatase. When you look at the RNA levels, there's really no change in the RNA level, either by RNA-seq, it's the same all in, in all stages. Uh, at microarray, it maybe goes down a little bit, but 
not all that much. This, remember, this is the splice leader RNA-seq. This is total microarray. What does change, though, is the position of the splice leader site. So in promaster goats, zero hours, the vast majority of the splice leader site is at minus 613 compared to the start site with only a small amount at closer, at minus 280. When you go to pro uh, amaster goats, these have switched. So in amaster goats, most of the RNA now has a short 5' UTR. It's not, it's not black and white. It's a change in proportion, but it's, it's pretty clear. So does that have a function? That moving the splice leader site closer to the ATG, well, what we know is that from ITRAC, the translation of this gene is lower because there's a, there's a lot less protein. So in this case, it looks like moving the splice leader site closer to the ATG might have resulted in, in less translation. Now, I haven't looked at the, splice, at the uh, ribosome profiling data to confirm that yet. I should do that at some stage. Just to indicate that that's not a golden rule, here's another case. No change in the RNA level. You go from, again, most of the RNA being having a long 5' UTR to about the same. And in this case, the protein levels go up. So changing the 5' UTR appears to be able to increase and decrease or decrease translation depending on the particular gene that you're looking at. Uh, so these obviously need to be followed up on. So in summary, we've got different RNA-seq libraries available to answer different questions. We've mapped most of the messenger RNA levels for L major and for L Donovani and then L Mexicana. We've mapped the five prime ends and L Torrentally, we've mapped the five prime ends. There's not very much response to nutritional stress at the mRNA level, but there's some. There's extensive stage specific regulation of mRNA abundance and spice leader uh, selection, but there's even more translational control during differentiation. Uh, and here's the acknowledgement of the people who were involved in much of this work. Um, there's some newer people that I haven't actually got on this slide yet. So um, I think that's, oh, that's more collaborators. This is for stuff for collaborative things. So I didn't show you the base J stuff, but other people that I was collaborating with. And I think that's it. <laughs>